Good morning from Copenhagen and a warm welcome to our CBIT Global Coordination Webinar on lessons learned and good practices from CBIT project implementation in Kenya. This webinar is hosted by the Unit DTU Partnership. My name is Frederick Stown and I'm the project manager of the CBIT Global Coordination Platform here at the Unit DTU Partnership and I will be the moderator for this webinar. A couple of practical things before we move to the main content of our webinar. This webinar is going to be about 60 minutes long and will include a Q&A session at the end. We therefore uh, highly recommend you to use this opportunity to ask questions. You can send us your questions throughout the whole webinar on the right side of your screen in the GoToWebinar software and we'll do our best to answer as many questions as possible at the end. In case you cannot stay until the end of the webinar or want to rewatch the presentation. The recording of the webinar will be available online in a few days on the CBIT Global Coordination Platform under Events and then CBIT Webinars. Here you can also find earlier webinars which can be very useful for your work, so please have a look. You will also receive an email after the webinar with the link to the recording. Now I would like to briefly introduce the speakers of today's webinar. Our main speaker for today is Mike Olendo, and Mike is the project manager for the CBIT project in Kenya and has a background in natural resource management and vulnerability assessments. Mike will be uh, supported by Dr. Peter Alele, who is the Senior Regional Director for Conservation Science at Conservation International, and also um, Charity Nalanya is with us today, and she is the Chief Manager for Africa at Conservation International. Now, I would like to shortly tell you about the content of today's webinar. First, I will give a very short overview of the status of CBIT projects worldwide, and shortly introduce you to the CBIT Global Coordination Platform. Then we will hear about the lessons learned from CBIT project implementation in Kenya. And at the end, we will have a Q&A session where everybody can get engaged and ask our panelists about the CBIT project in Kenya. You can reach the CBIT Global Coordination Platform by going to www.cbitplatform.org and on the front page, you'll see a global map with an overview of the status of different CBIT projects worldwide. On the left hand side, you can see that more than 30 projects in Latin America, Africa, Asia and Europe have their concepts approved. Eight projects, mostly in Latin America and Africa, have been approved and a further 17 projects are actually under implementation. Some of these projects are global or regional in scope, but most are national. Out of the 17 projects on the implementation, 15 are national projects. And one of those is the CBIT project in Kenya that we will hear more about in a bit. The overall aim of the CBIT Global Coordination Platform is to enable coordination, maximize learning opportunities, and enable knowledge sharing among CBIT countries. This is why we're organizing these webinars to hear about the lessons learned from different countries as inspiration for other CBIT countries. Now a few examples of, of how to benefit from the CBIT coordination platform. Um, all users can follow the implementation of CBIT projects uh, worldwide and reach out to the, the, the focal points of the different projects to learn from the implementation of different activities or specific outputs of interest. Also, when you're designing CBIT projects, the platform provides easy access to understand what other projects focus on and what the progress indicators are. If you're about to design a CBIT project, this is an excellent way to get inspiration to shape uh, and design your projects. When implementing project activities, country focal points are supposed to upload documents, workshop reports, and other uh, project documents, and this will give users of the platform access to a wealth of information and learning. Focal points also do yearly self-assessments of capacity and that helps countries to bridge the gaps in their transparency systems. 
Lastly, uh, the website or the platform provides webinars, articles, and other knowledge exchange services. You can also read about other CBIT projects, such as uh, Costa Rica and Chile, under the section Articles in CBIT Perspectives. And lastly, I would like to point out that we are all part of the global CBIT family. More than 50 countries are already engaged in CBIT and more countries are in the process of joining. And the CBIT Global Coordination Platform provides you with an easy and structured access to information about all current projects and the projects to come. It is of course very important that all country focal points are actively engaged in the platform and continuously update the progress of their projects. And you can always reach out to us if you have any questions or comments. So one more time, welcome to this webinar. And uh, I would like to now give the floor to Mike Olendo, who will present on the lessons learned from the implementation of the CBIT project in Kenya. And remember that no questions are stupid or anything. Please ask any question um, you feel like, as, as this is why we are here, to, to share lessons learned. Mike, over to you. Hello, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, um, and I'm glad to be able to share with you what you've learned so far implementing the CBIT Kenya project. Uh, so first of all, thank you so much for taking time to listen to, to us, to me. And let me delve now into what has been or what is the CBIT Kenya project. So uh, the CBIT Kenya project uh, was set up to enhance uh, to, en to enhance the system for the, the system for tracking emissions and building capacity for IPCC sectors to ensure that Kenya complies uh, towards the Paris Agreement on Transparency requirements. The project was or is uh, divided into three components, uh, which we'll, I can truncate into that uh, the first project, the, the first component that is strengthening national institutions and capacity. Basically, here we looked at how to develop the national greenhouse gas inventory and also strengthening the institutions that are, uh, 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 are providing information and data towards the inventory. So we developed also sector, sectoral inventories. And then the second component was to support the already existing uh, emission tracking system. That is the system for land emission uh, estimation for Kenya, that is SLIC. That is was to ensure, uh, this is a system that's already existing and it was already doing, inform, uh, focusing on uh, all the land sector, looking at how it can be able to automate and ensure that quality data from the land sector is being uh, developed to track and uh, to track and estimate emissions. So CBIT can also supported this aspect. And then the third aspect was looking at supporting the coordination. And uh, basically here we're looking at uh, ensuring that there is a coordinated approach in terms of information sharing and uh, information sharing and ensuring that either both climate actions and impact are reported in a way that is coordinated. And, and this involves several steps. But the first one here that CBIT Kenya is contributing for towards is having an online MR, MR recognition platform and uh, basically also ensuring that the annotated GHG inventory, uh, uh, the GHG inventory is put online. And then uh, the implementation and uh, arrangements, uh, uh, this I think is fairly straightforward. The donor is the Global Environment Facility. The implementation agency is Conservation International, CIGF agency. And the executing agency is the was or is the Ministry of Environment through the Climate Change Directorate and the SLIC, that is the city, uh, that is the, the, the system for, for land emission estimation for Kenya, which already was already existing before the, the CBT project came into force. And the implementing partners were the Vital Science Program within Conservation International and the Greenhouse Gas Management Institution, which uh, was it, it, uh, it then became a very key resource in terms of capacity building. Uh, I'll go directly into the lessons learned from the uh, from the inception sp uh, 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 stage. What you realize that first of all, uh, normally it's not as apparent that, of, or especially for this project, it's not as apparent within the development that is going to be a data intensive project, because as as I said earlier, the First, the, the first component, uh, development of the GHG inventory, means that uh, you have to pull in data, you have to pull in information, you have to bring all key stakeholders. And in this case, the, these are private industries, 
you've got private sector uh, organizations, you've got key departments within the government into providing information that is relevant in terms of developing a greenhouse gas inventory. So first, they have to understand why they're doing this, why is it important, and what does it mean in terms, for example, for private sector, does it mean that uh, this information, which can be proprietary, will be used or can be used against them or can be used to track their, their, their proprietary information or proprietary competitive advantage. So that first part, uh, setting up uh, institutional data arrangement is very critical. In Kenya and, and, and even within the, the, the project document, we had planned or, or we had thought that we probably will do a memorandum of association. But then we realized that this is tricky because the memorandum of, of association require a higher level of signing and take longer even to just get signed. And that has got no guarantee that it will be implemented as it is stated. And ideally, most MOUs are very vague. So we thought, uh, why not uh, develop, uh, you use, use a sectoral approach, meaning that we request key institutions and key sectors to nominate sector leads at least two and for these sector leads, we developed what we call terms of reference that involve provision of data to the GHG inventory. And from that now, it became easier for both, uh, first of all, to train these sector leads, and second, for the data to start flowing toward a central repository that was now uh, that, that that was being led by the Climate Change Directorate. So first, the, the key part here is that uh, it is never apparent that it's a data inten intensive project. But once you start implementing, to realize that you require that. And the other part is that uh, for, for, for most of the government uh, department, they, 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 there, was, there was a bit of a mis, um, mishmash, or I would say the, uh, a mishmash between expectations and what the project was delivering. For some, since they look at it, they thought that it's going to support data collection. And now we had now to indicate that, no, we're already seeking to develop or to collect information that is really existing into a format that is responsive towards the greenhouse gas inventory. So we had again to change that aspect. Then the second thing that we 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 we, we grapple with at the start is that, uh, like in many other countries, I reckon the climate space is fluid, dynamic, and has got many other players. And here we had to look at who are the key players, who are the periphery periphery players, and whom do we need to partner, and who are willing to uh, who are who are willing to partner with us. To deliver some of our objectives and their objectives as well which objectives were dovetailing together so here we this is where we we, we, we sought uh, we sought a coalition approach in which we had one partner that is the low emission for resilience project a uh, project done uh, uh, in short it's called LECRID, that is uh, uh, implemented under the UNDP by UNDP and here because they also had within their 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 mandate or their objectives to deliver an MRV framework and also a GHG inventory, we're able to partner well without duplication or replication of effort. And then for other for, for the for the other periphery projects and institutions, we developed a harmonized work plan so that anyone can see what the other person is delivering and what they are doing towards and when that ends, so that it's easy for someone to know whether to come in, when to come in. And then uh, uh, and, and that at least helped to bring most of the institutions that are involved in the climate space together. I will not say it was perfect or it is perfect, but it set the bench or the foundation for future and current engagement. And then uh, another aspect that really helped uh, in, in, in ensuring that the project was relevant and it's, it's, the, it's, uh, it, there was ownership was the, there was a higher target. Kenya is seeking to deliver its national communication, it's third national communication, and the, 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 the greenhouse gas inventory provides the best learning information for that. And, 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 and that being the case, it meant that there was higher level interest and push uh, by, by senior technocrats to have a greenhouse gas inventory for Kenya to be ready in time. And second, also Kenya seeks to develop a biannual update report. I would say that uh, especially for, for, for this project, we do not delve so much into adaptation aspect because you're looking uh, uh, or, or, or supported we do not support a lot of adaptation uh, adaptation issues but we focus on the mitigation because there's that aspect that you you have to decide on uh, in, in the end of to implement you have to decide exactly on where you can have impact and what you can do realistically and accomplish so but also uh, part of the greenhouse gas inventory 
uh, the, uh, has direct contribute to what the biannual update reports. And as you know, the biannual update reports both reports both on mitigation and adaptation aspect in terms of climate action and impact. And then, uh, 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 as it is now, we are in 2019, year 2020, that magic, magical year uh, where we're having NDC negotiations and all these projects, are, the, the, the deliverables of this project dovetails towards that, knowing that as people are heading towards the, the COP in December and next year, looking at what countries need to, do, to report on what they are doing in terms of NDCs, the key deliverers of these projects were providing insights, for example, the, the emissions, the emission trends, uh, which industry is, 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 is uh, which industry is emitting what, all that provides uh, a clear baseline or benchmark in terms of how Kenya is doing in terms of its tendencies. And again, uh, the other aspect is that also Kenya is developing its Red Plus Readiness Framework, that is uh, for uh, uh, which which involves developing the forest reference level again. Uh, the, the inventory provided in from, uh, has, has got a clear association with that. And then looking at the national forest monitoring system, again, the information and the co coalition of partners that are involved in this project also had clear linkages and had, had uh, 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 I say there was a seamless sharing of information for this aspect and which provided a ground soul of support for the delivery of the project and buy-in. Uh, again, uh, second, uh, uh, looking at other uh, uh, lesson learned, especially during the uh, at the inception phase of the project, I would say the first thing, and I've already alluded to it, that we, uh, someone needs or we need to really, uh, uh, once once you develop the product, everything is approved, we, the implementation mechanism has to be refined. I say we have to go back to the drawing board and see does the reality reflect what is on the product. And sometimes you realize that some uh, 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 knowing that the pro the time it takes to develop a Jeff project, sometimes you get that the sand may have shifted on your feet from your on uh, 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 on the ground, meaning that you have to again see how do you well how, how can you deliver the project as as per the aspiration that you set for Jeff. And this is why I say that then uh, always is that the implementation mechanisms has to be refined. And again, I said, this is not, it, this is a continuous process. Things change all the time. And that takes a while, uh, as you can see here, that it may take, I would say one or two months or even more, and it will continue to change as the project gets implemented. And then it, it's, it's critical, at least to ensure that uh, the, the deliverables of the project do not just disappear. It is important to anchor into, or to, to anchor them at least one or two onto uh, national commitments, goals or objectives, and then uh, stakeholder engagement. Uh, uh, it may not be apparent when you're setting up with, with these projects, uh, especially for CBAT, but it's a front-facing project, meaning that the, the, the stakeholder buy-in, stakeholder engagement is critical, and it is something that you have to do every other day to ensure that you keep on track with with with, with the aspirations and uh, and objectives of both of, of my right partners. And by and also to ensure that uh, ownership it continues, I would say that this is this has been a struggle for us all through. I, I cannot say we've done it perfectly, but we've done the best to, of our ability to ensure that this is this continues to be in uh, uh, in, in, in 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 the radar of government officials and especially the climate change directorate in terms of the delivery that CBIT was providing. And then. Uh, uh, when you look at most of the products that are of our project documents for CBA, you realize that sometimes we are too ambitious when you're writing. But again, <laughs> when you come down, it's important that these deliverables are well anchored and make a relevant to government officials and other partners locally, and also the time that we set to do them. Because uh, with ambition, sometimes we over we may over promise, and that's. That's a key critic for us as well is that we may overpromise, but then when it comes really to to the to the to delivering, realize actually you can deliver out of the ten things that you thought you could deliver within the specified time frame. Maybe you can only deliver one and you deliver it well. And sometimes it's better to deliver well and uh, one and well than try to deliver many and not deliver them pretty well. And then the capacity needs assessment. I would say that uh, this this is a fluid area and it depends really on. On, on, on the context of the country and the stakeholders. Uh, but keep always keep in mind that uh, most of the people are adult learners. 
and the attention span is critical. The, the attention span is short, and then you need to get them at, uh, really attentive to ensure that some of the lessons, some of the skill set that are being passed on remain within their departments and they can able to implement them on their own even after the project ends. Because I say that the sustainability of the project is really the capacity that is imparted and is used going forward. So I'll say that uh, uh, those who are, uh, I'll say that they being uh, open to different capacity uh, techniques or different ways of learning or or or, or uh, imparting knowledge assist uh, 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 will help in, in 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 delivering the message. And then uh, the other aspect is. Uh, again, I would say uh, still now uh, focusing on capacity building is that here we, I would say we did grapple. We wondered what 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 opportunity or what method can we use because you can it can be a classroom way, it can be online, and I would say that uh, what you immediately will learn from online why there was excitement in taking in enrolling for online classes, the execution was nil. There are very people who were who. who who, who followed up with online classes, mainly because of their busy schedule, or sometimes I'll say that there was that disconnect because it's only after, at the end of the, at the end of the full, I'll say capacity building that the, and people understood how the, an inventory works and what it means that people started picking up on the online classes. So it means it meant that probably uh, in terms of development or in terms of designing such projects, it would be good first of all to let people understand what inventory is, what they can do, how their roles and, and responsibilities. Then at the end, once they see how an inventory contributes, what I'll say, uh, tracking emissions, NDCs, and then they can say they see the need to boost their knowledge and probably get a certificate online. And that's how uh, I, I think I, I've seen it pan out for the CBAT Kenya project. So what we did was say we, 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 we took learning by doing, which is laborious slow painstaking slow because you have to ensure that uh, and i'll say that not all sectors will move in tandem but i'll say that it was uh, it, it was better it was better because it ensured that the knowledge was fully anchored people understood especially per sector they understood the kind of information they need to collect collect and analyze in order to be able to track emissions in their sector and that and after the sector inventory, it is easy now for CCD or the climate change uh, uh, directorate to be able to collect to have a most, uh, I would say, the national inventory. But now each sector now understands what it did, how to be able to 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 calculate to co to co which information, which are the key categories, what it means, and also to analyze and interpret uh, emission results, which is important, uh, especially now that uh, per law, each sector is supposed to have a climate change direct uh, desk. Uh, the other part is that to ensure this is this newly built capacity is fully entrenched, it's critical that a second iteration of an inventory that uh, people learn because in, in the development of, of an inventory there, there is documentation and where people fall short, where gaps exist, what they are not able to do, they can improve that in the second iteration. So I would say that we don't we should we should not just stop at the development of the first inventory that is done through learning by doing, but now the team to ensure that also the team gels. A second iteration is important and then uh again uh, i would say that in, in uh, as i said earlier in kenya there was limited uptake of online courses at the onset but as the project has continued and people have started to people take in the information as, as regards to the need for uh, the importance of tracking emissions understood their role especially sectoral law, role and thought and and, and 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 with that this so that they just just don't need to get to to understand learning by doing but it would be good to have prob probably documentation to show that they are conversant in these techniques the online training have picked up at the very end of the project which for me i say it's good and then uh of course uh turnover is, 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 is normal people are transferred people are retiring and people just lose interest sometimes because uh, we started with over i think 60 but at the end we had around 30 35 who, who who had gone through the whole process and understood the inventory so i would say that uh the, the diversity is good they but also have to put in mind that you have to get a, a team that can gel and then uh looking at uh, uh 
good practices that uh, I, I can talk about or I can highlight here is that, uh, which I would say that help also is that we built, we, we did not really start from the scratch. We built from the re existing policy arrangements and also uh, there, there had been attempts to develop or to do what the CBT project are doing, but they're not being successful. Ideally, there was a project that had tried to do this for three years and it had been unable to do that. But those lessons, especially in terms of the uh, institutional arrangement, uh, getting the correct people or the right people, ensuring that there was buy-in in the sectors, but also trying to uh, not to get bogged down in the aspect of data collection, instead look at data collation, help in uh, fashioning this project in a way that we could be able to do what we're supposed to do in the stipulated time or within the, the aspect that we, we needed to do. And again, I'll say that the appointment of focal leads or focal, sec uh, uh, focal or sector leads uh, to lead in the sector uh, in, for the IPC sector helped a lot because now they were these they were the titular head that helped uh, navigate within the departments to see the uh, to access or to access information or push uh, for understanding on why there was need for an inventory development. Basically, we this became the, uh, the ambassadors for the project within their sectors, and from that, uh, uh, and also the basically the help in developing what we call buy-in in, in uh, for government officials that may not have direct in, uh, interaction with the project, but at least understood where the project was leading in terms of the development of the inventory and eventually uh, building capacity of key government uh, partners to be able to do this inventory. Uh, 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 independent, independently in future. Uh, so uh, uh, again, reiterating this, I would say that uh, what what I will say now or say is that it's important to anchor the deliver, deliverables on wide national commitments and goals. You do that. You it, it's not easy. I'm not saying it's uh, uh, it, it's not easy, but you looking at the trajectory of what, for example, the climate space is in your country or where you are, you can be able to see or get a, something to latch on that makes the deliverable of the project relevant. It could be just building even the capacity because in some places there is no that capacity. And some places is that it could be building the department's ability to understand the priority agreement. So the aspect that you can do to ensure that the project relevance remains or is sustainable going forward. And, and, and also, also to reiterate that, I'll say that stakeholders and these stakeholders unfortunately these are not are not your normal stakeholders as i learned in in in, 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 in implementing the cdat kenya these are some some of the stakeholders are high level government technocrats so some uh, have got either long uh, have got long experience in let's say climate negotiations they've got long experience in terms of administration but also what they and, and, but because of i say the uh, the the new party agreement, everything now is, everyone has to relearn or understand the new tricks, relearn new tricks or understand the new processes or the new way of doing things as to align with the party agreement transparency requirements. So, but then often you get, you, uh, this can be your champions, but also they can be an impediment. So uh, which means that we have always to continuously engage, see what is happening. And for me, I would say that, uh, it's, it's, it has to be a regular aspect, and I would say some some supporters can change into non-supporters, but again, at least once the the nitty gritty or the substance of the or the subject matter is well understood, that uh, 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 that is often what matters. And then the other part is that uh, again, deliverables, deliverables, again have to you I think uh, uh, to be to uh, you have to time your deliverables in a way that they are relevant to national processes, but also we deliver them in a way that it enriches the process that are happening uh, 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 nationally. And for me, I'll say that initially the, the CBAT Kenya project had lots of deliverables. You have to sift through and say that some of these are tactical, some of these are strategic, some of these you look at it, uh, you feel that maybe they are supposed they, when they, it was being developed, they were supposed to appease a particular segment that was in the in the uh, project development. But when you come into the implementation, realize when you look at the bigger picture, it's way way important to have fewer but well thought total deliverables that align to what is happening in the country at the moment. 
uh, other aspects that uh, uh, that I also will highlight here is that uh, the, the need to, uh, uh, in terms of good practices, is that it's uh, of good practices and ensuring transparency is having that community of practice. What we are lucky, what we were lucky a little bit in Kenya, I say that, but it's something that can be done better, is that we had we used to have a high level uh, presentation of all projects in climate uh, in climate change, meaning that all the projects that have got an, ha, are implementing activities or uh, delivering on the Kenya climate change as a uh, field, we used to have a quarterly, initially it was monthly, but then it moved into a quarterly presentation on what they have delivered and what they are doing. That provided, that provides, uh, I would say, a transparent way of knowing what the other person is doing. We uh, And also it, it, it creates, uh, I would say, a community of practice. But going forward, I would say that even for CBIT projects globally, to be good, this community of practice is elevated higher in that lessons learned from, let's say, from Kenya can be relevant or can inform, can be of relevance in the implementation of Uganda, let's say, or Rwanda or other countries. So I would say this is something that we should be picked up and strengthened. And again, I say peer-to-peer -peer learning. I understand uh, probably Kenya is one of the first that is uh, uh, completing its uh, CBAT project. But I would say the other 30 and the other 17 that are under implementation to be good to at least have a peer-to-peer -peer learning uh, as a, a, a framework where, for example, managers or key implementers, both government and uh, the implementing agencies are learning or have having a, a discussions on how to better have impact for CBT. Because CBT projects, are, unlike others, they are, I would say they're time bound, they're short, and also they're supposed, they, they, are, they are often supposed to provide solution to a particular issue that a country has highlighted in terms of its commitment to the Paris Agreement. So they're not really, I will not say they're not essentially designed to be long-term projects. And that is critical when uh, we are looking at how to have this impact in the shortest time possible without, uh, also I just say in the shortest time possible. And that uh, the other part is that harmonized implementation. Again, uh, with, with especially in, in, in the developing countries space is that there is a lot of money that is coming in to support mitigation, adaptation, capacity, and from myriad of partners. This sometimes muddles up the climate space and creates either competing, duplicating, replicating aspects, and sometimes rivalries that do not add up or do not support, uh, uh, I would say, uh, uh, are not uh, good for basically do not lead to do not lead to any other place but having initially uh, and, and this means that also you have to give and take you may have some deliverable that you think you really are best at place but probably another project is way way better place to deliver an example for kenya is that uh within the product and within the the implementation mechanism we thought we could deliver on the registry however looking at when we started looking at how we can do this we realized that probably a better another project that is the gni plus was way way better to deliver on the registry because it had a longer time frame and the registry part is done at the very end. And for CBAT projects, you see at the very end, you're supposed to be closing up and looking forward. So it's not something that we can say that we're doing at the very end or, 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 or it's not something that we thought we could, when, when we realistically looked at it, we said that, no, 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 this may not be the best, we may not be the best project to deliver on the registry. And this again was, the, was discussed in an open forum and, it, and as we move ahead, you can see that uh, whereas we are developing the coordination MRV web platform, there are other projects and partners who are developing the framework. And then in the end, all of us are giving it to another project to complete the process, which is a way of ensuring that there is sustainability and there is no duplication of, of effort. And then uh, the other aspect that also came up will be strengthening the data analysis we could see that especially in terms of uh, sector sector leads and focal points uh, understanding the inventory data understanding the climate uh, requirements or, or say the, the requirement as for the ipcc software were critical uh, i'll say that the key part and i think for most people that really did appreciate is the, the guidance that the greenhouse gas management institute provided to all sectors in terms of understanding their roles understanding the data that is required and also the 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 their the vast knowledge of the ipcc software helped in ensuring that the, the data analysis was snug free but again i'll say that 
we are lucky on that aspect, but the, that analysis aspect has to be strengthened also going forward. Uh, of acting lessons I learned from the CBAT, I would say that, um, uh, and this is uh, again reiterating, is that we have to uh, uh, clearly define roles and responsibilities are critical. Uh, sometimes, some, especially when you're looking at implementing and executing uh, roles, sometimes they, uh, uh, some can, uh, there is crossover, but it's good that this is continually reviewed and people, under, uh, especially if there are different institutions, they understand exactly what are their roles and uh, uh, and ensuring that also the deliverables are anchored or someone knows exactly who is delivering what and how that will how basically for me clarity in, in in roles is essential again stakeholder engagement uh, in developing these projects often you do not really think that you're going to you think you you're already preaching to the converted but then when you implement them you realize yes uh, people the converted have got a different view of what they are converted upon so you have to really now streamline their thought process and tell them this is where uh, we need to focus on and this is how we, it would be good to see of course in a consensus but again that takes a while uh, uh, again uh, uh, capacity needs you have to choose to, 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 to choose amongst the many available options on which way to deliver your capacity development and then for government and I don't know for other countries but for me, uh, in terms of engagement, uh, we, didn't, we, 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 we thought there wouldn't be so much because of the capacity development and the, 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 the aspect, the, especially the capacity development that the project was bringing in and the importance in terms of the nascent climate change directorate. But in that, I think you are a bit wrong because the, 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 the need or the engagement or without PADM or DSA proved to be a, nearly a, a breaking point for us, but I think with time, uh, as we refine and as other projects refine, or maybe for others, it may be not be an issue. But for 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 the CBAT Kenya project, DSA and PADM eventually became a flash. Uh, I felt that the time taken or the time for the project was a bit too short for what it was supposed to deliver, and 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 and, and remembering that you have to first of all really. Uh, create uh, a consensus uh, buy-in before even anything is started and then uh, looking at the need for capacity you realize that probably it would be good to, to check on the duration and be realistic and again the real uh, that being realistic also delves down into what is what deliverables can be realistically delivered within that time the other aspect is the development of the coordination platform uh, this again, I would say that uh, for, 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 for uh, communication and ensuring there's coordination within the climate space, as I said, there is there are many players. It's essential, and and we've started this. I say this is nascent because the online GSD inventory and registry, or I would say MRV platform, is something that uh, it's currently I would say on a pilot stage. We are putting the inventory online. We are putting uh, so that people can see. Uh, can understand what it, uh, the trends and emissions vis a vis the NDCs and pro probably the, uh, for Kenya from the second national communication. But it's not something, it's something that we are trialing out. It may be a good thing, it may be something that the government receives that it's a way it can be a communication tool, or eventually they may see it that they need to close up the data and not share this information because of other, other, other aspects. But for us, it's a pilot. Uh, uh, it's, it's a pilot, and we hope that eventually uh, the online invent the online inventory registry and the general MRV platform can be something that is virtual and accessible to everyone. Basically, we like to democratize the climate space or uh, the climate space access to information. And then, uh, uh, just to reiterate again, uh, anchoring to national processes, and then uh, I was, uh, the other aspect is also trying to. In the initial stage, trying to reach as many as possible government sectors, relevant sectors, and people, so that even if attrition occurs, you have a critical number that can push the process forward. And again, uh, 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 not just looking, not just limiting yourself to government, but here, as I said earlier, we had CSOs, we had private sector, and academia. And again, uh, we tried as much as we could to. Uh, look at the, uh, I would say, intergenerational equity, ensuring that we don't, because uh, 
for most of this work you realize that uh, uh the our target the target audience or the the natural target audience are a bit high level government officials but then you real uh, 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 when you look at sustainability and availability you realize that you also have to look at a lower cadre and a bit younger officials or people to ensure that the, they, they, they they are already buying into the process and also they're getting trained for the future thank you for your attention and i'm open to any other questions or any clarification that you may require from me thank you thank you so much uh, mike for this very informative uh, presentation about the cbit project in kenya um, just to remind uh, all the participants that you can uh, send us your questions uh, on the right side of your screen in the go to webinar software and um, before we go to the q a session I will just give the floor um, quickly to Charity. Um, if you would like to provide any additional information, Charity. Okay. Now, and from an implementing, I'll share my lessons from an implementing agency's point of view. So, capacity building is a continuous process, and the results of these CBT projects will be felt long term. Yet, the duration of the CBT project is short. Therefore, um, from an implementing agency point of view, uh, it's important when you're designing the project and also during project implementation to ensure the CBT project is linked and anchored on ongoing transparency activities so as to ensure continuity and long-term impact. And I'd also like to say that during the project life, that is during project implementation phase, um, various, transparency active, uh, various transparency gaps and opportunities will be identified. Um, therefore, it's imperative that we also take note of these gaps, uh, challenges, opportunities, and any other things that may come up. Um, this can be turned into a bankable project in the future. Um, also, another important thing to note is countries are very unique and you need to tailor the capacity building tools to a country. For instance, it was noted that in Kenya, the, the online training, as much as it was exciting to take, to take up the courses, the online training was not a very ideal for this country. Other techniques were used that were more ideal. So it's during capacity needs assessment, this is something to factor when you're assessing the tools so that you tailor the uh, capacity building tools to the country's context. And then uh, uh, during setup, during the inception phase, it's imperative also to uh, emphasize adaptive management, adaptive, adaptive project management, prepare teams to anticipate change and to respond to these changes that may arise. For instance, the biggest challenge that was experienced in this project was high turnover during a uh, high, high turnover of participants during the capacity building activities so when you prepare the teams uh, now this is a lesson learned to prepare the teams um, you can avoid duplication of tasks and then you will have adequate time to address any challenges that you may face and then keep up with ongoing transparency activities in the country and forge partnerships to avoid duplication of efforts Lastly, I would also like to emphasize on safeguards. Uh, this project triggered three safeguards, environmental safeguards specifically, the accountability and grievance mechanism, gender mainstreaming, and stakeholder engagement. It's imperative to raise awareness about these safeguards because they might look minor, but they play a very critical role towards the success of the project. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much for your input, um, Charity. Uh, we also have Peter online. Peter Lele, uh, would you like to provide any short additional information? I'll, I'll quickly just emphasize what Mike and, and, and Charity has uh, have talked about. Two points. One, the duration of the project and, 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 and the approach that Kenya took. Um, it's, it's absolutely great to go into a country like Kenya and and do the training, capacity building, and, and make sure that you procure some equipment to help them uh, do their data management better. And, and you would have uh, delivered for a CBIT project. But in this case, we made a decision to do two things. One, to align the capacity building to deliverables, such as um, 
the national communications. And we chose to do uh, a national greenhouse gas inventory, which we, we know very well can contribute to the national communications. And then secondly, as Mike mentioned, we chose a learn by doing approach. Rather than train everyone, we decided that let's, let's develop a greenhouse gas inventory by Kenyans uh, so that uh, as they are trained, they learn by actually developing a greenhouse gas inventory. Um, and, and that was quite a challenge because it, it, it turned out into uh, a complex uh, task. But eventually it was very, very useful because now we have a crop of people who have actually developed a greenhouse gas inventory uh, in Kenya. The second thing is that the environment that we work in, you, you have to deal with things like uh, the policies and the practice. Uh, the greenhouse, uh, sorry, the CBIT project is, is quite short. So um, you might not find it quite productive to, to carry out data collection if you want to do an inventory. So we, we chose applying the data that's available in Kenya. Um, and that means you have to navigate the existing practices and policies in the country. Extensive engagement is required to do that. Confidence building, buy-in, and, and making people understand that, yes, you're accessing their data uh, for a cause as important as a greenhouse gas inventory for Kenya. And, and you're not only dealing with government agencies, but NGOs, and in some cases, even the private sector, who have all of this data for a country like Kenya. So it's, it's quite intensive for the first few months, but eventually, uh, once you have everyone in, you come up with some really great results. Secondly, uh, as Charity has said, uh, capacity for a country like Kenya is, is, is quite, uh, uh, you know, you need extensive capacity. And what you do in one or so years usually doesn't cover all the capacity needs. And so this is a process. Uh, and I think that um, what we need to start thinking about is how to build on the work that we have done in a country like Kenya. One of the greatest indicators that we have seen uh, recently is that our initial meetings, the people who attended our initial meetings in Kenya, um, perhaps half, perhaps more of them were no longer appearing in the meetings that we had uh, in, in, in the final weeks of the project. Uh, that means that, um, you know, people have moved, people have moved government agencies, people have left Kenya, people have left and moved to different sectors, but there's a need to continue this process of strengthening capacity uh, because eventually you want people in a country like Kenya that can manage data and, and contribute to uh, greenhouse gas reporting. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you, Peter, very much for your contribution. Um, now we go to the Q&A session and uh, we have a few questions before we, we finalize the webinar. And uh, there's one on how that would like to know more about the, how it was to work with a big uh, international institute as a GHG Management Institute compared to maybe working with local consultants that have more knowledge about the local context. And I think, Mike, that would go to you. Thank you. I think uh, what, what the Greenhouse Gas Management Institute brought on board was that it was the Greenhouse Gas Management Institute was, was baked into the proposal from the onset. So during the scoping stage, they, they, they already knew what they needed to do. But then for me, I would say that the uh, answering the question is that the Greenhouse Gas Management Institute brings that glo and global experience, but also uh, countries that have got similar gaps and, uh, and uh, deficiencies, they're able to bring context to Kenya and also guide the process in a way that probably somebody who's only looking at Kenya context would not have been able to, because uh, I'll say that actually in terms of, uh, uh, let's say, third party reviewers, independent reviewers, we benefited from having one of the, uh, uh, a few international reviewers looking at the work that Kenya team was doing and giving pointers on how to improve certain aspects of the inventory, as opposed to, to ha only having local or locally focused, uh, I would say, capacity building team. So I would say they, they brought, uh, they brought both the global uh, experience, but I would say also in, 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 in their way of doing things, they really tailored their course and approach to the Kenyan contents, context uh, by, by first also uh, having staff or having uh, key uh, 
le- uh, some of the leaders and uh, had worked in Kenya and other and, 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 and in third world countries, which they deployed to ensure that they they can assist sectors and the country better. So I think they, there was flexibility in the way GH Jamai uh, uh, deployed his team to assist the Ken- to assist the Kenya CBIT project. Thank you so much, uh, Mike. Um, there is one more question um, about the the duration of the project because it, it's I think it's it was very short, only 18 months. So maybe this goes to you, Charity. Why why did you choose to such a short duration for the project? First of all, I should mention that during the PPG phase, a lot of consultations are done with the stakeholders. So this was arrived at the duration was arrived during the PPG phase. However, as Mike has men- had mentioned in one of his points before, it was realized that some activities are taking longer to implement than others. So at some point we had to extend um, the duration for three months. Thank you, Charity. I think um, there is a question on what will be the next step for Kenya after the CBIT project? How will you, I think you mentioned a few things, uh, Mike, related to this, but maybe uh, Charity, you can also um, give us some some, some clarifications on, on how will you ensure that the impact will last? I can start by saying that Mike, uh, the entire team has been working with various partners to implement this project, such as ICAT, um, uh, the, uh, UND, the UNDP Low Carbon Development Project, amongst others. So some of the activities are being implement, have been pushed to these other partners who already have ongoing projects. So they'll support, for instance, oper- operationalization of the greenhouse gas inventory, as well as the MRB system, uh, since the projects are already ongoing. Um, Mike can also add to that. Charity, I think we're running out of time. I think that that was good and, and you answered the question. So I would like to uh, to to say that, that we have come to the end of the webinar and uh, I would like to give a big thanks to, to our panelists, Mike, uh, Peter and Charity, for their very informative presentations and for sharing the lessons learned with all of us. And also a big thanks to the audience for their participation. And uh, finally, if you have any questions or comments, please get in touch. Um, I'm sure Mike and, and uh, Peter and Charity, they are available for any further, further questions or comments. And uh, this webinar will be uploaded uh, to the CBIT Global Coordination uh, Platform. So please uh, keep an eye open uh, for future webinars. Finally, thank you very much for your attention and uh, we wish you all a good day from Copenhagen. Thank you.